first session. Gecko is um, the echo version or the gastro version of echo, which is hosted by the Gastro Foundation of South Africa in association with the University of New Mexico. So today we've got our pediatric version and um, we've, we've uh, managed to clinch Andrew Grieve to speak to us today about biliary atresia. Uh, we've had about 53 registrations from nine different African countries. And the way we're gonna run it today is Andrew's got a pre-recorded presentation for us. Um, and after that will be available for, uh, for questions. I think biliary atresia is one of the big differentiators in, um, in the quality of care that our children receive in developing countries versus the first world. And I'm sure Andrew is going to go into that. But I, um, I feel that it's an important platform to discuss what we're doing, what we're doing wrong, and how we can improve outcomes. So over to you, Andrew. Cool. Thanks very much, Tim. And thanks very much for having me. I'm just going to set up my screen share and we can get going. Thank you for this opportunity to join your meeting today. My name is Andrew Grieve. I'm a pediatric surgeon working at the Wits University and I'm based at the Nelson Mandela Children's Hospital in Johannesburg. Today I'm going to chat with you about some aspects of biliary atresia and just how they relate to the Gordian knot. So biliary atresia is described as a progressive obliterating cholangiopathy that involves both the extrahepatic and the intrahepatic bile ducts. Essentially, there's fibrosis of the duct that results in occlusion of the lumen. And despite this definition, we use it for a multitude of scenarios that result in the same endpoint of the liver failing to drain bile into a normal ductal system. So we're all aware of the routine findings of newborn babies of physiological jaundice. The question we need to ask ourselves really is, you know, when does this natural phenomenon you know, cease to be normal? And when do the alarm bells start to ring? A group in Texas managed to retrospectively analyze their routine serology done in under 60 days of, uh, sorry, under 60 hours of life, and then correlated to patients who ultimately demonstrated having biliary atresia. They found that the total, total bilirubin levels in this affected cohort were the same as in patients with purely physiological jaundice. However, when they looked at the conjugated fraction, it was elevated in the biliary atresia patients, even in this early uh, point in life. Uh, you know, the point of this is not really to solidify in your minds whether or not biliary atresia is acquired or a congenital anomaly, but rather to state that if there's any doubt, you know, a simple full bilirubin analysis will often give you the answer about whether something is pathological or not. So our suggestion is that if a patient has persistent jaundice at 14 days of age, then a reason should be sought you know, for this, this jaundice and it should be considered to be pathological. If there's an elevated fraction of more than sort of between 20 and 50% of the total, then some type of obstructive phenomenon needs to be ruled out. The same Texas group changed their mean time to surgery for biliary atresia from 60 to 30 days with this newborn screening that they undertook and potentially we can do the same. So what clues do we need to consider? If we look at the conjugated fraction, it's water soluble. So this usually means that the urine is not clear and it's usually a dark yellow staining. The stool obviously doesn't reach, get any bile in it. And so it ends up being this pale sort of chalky color. And obviously the patient is jaundiced. So this clinical triad is a, a normal sort of described phenomenon when it comes to pay issues with obstructive jaundice. So the next step really following an elevated conjugated bilirubin would be ideally to send a unit that deals with these patients on a regular basis. And at that place, serology can be done uh, to exclude medical pathologies. Uh, an abdominal ultrasound will usually be done to look for other surgical conditions. 
such as um, cardiodocal malformations, implicated bile, spontaneous bile duct perforations, so things that may mimic biliary atresia. So what we can see is that really you know, children in South Africa have, have got really poor outcomes when it comes to biliary atresia. And these are generally due to a multitude of different challenges. Um, and, you know, earlier referral will go a long way to try and improve these outcomes. Ultrasound is not specifically good when it comes to diagnosing biliary atresia. Um, but it may raise concerns, especially if there's an atrophic gallbladder in a starved infant, or if there's what's called a triangular cord sign, which demonstrates fibrosis at the portal plate. So depending upon access to surgeons, an ultrasound guide liver biopsy may strengthen your concerns around possible biliary atresia. However, we don't really want to delay access to theatre whilst awaiting results. And we've generally found in our settings that biopsies can be challenged to interpret at times. HIDA scans have really gone out of favour uh, when it comes to the workup of biliary atresia. And this is due to the low sensitivity and specificity for biliary atresia. The colour of the stool is just as good an indicator of what the HIDA scan will show um, and that's just got minimal benefit in a, in a screening sort of setting. There's various ways to classify biliary atresia um, and these systems do give us some clues about the potential pathophysiology around biliary atresia. Anatomically the classification is described by the Japanese and relates to the extent of the proximal duct obliteration. Type 1 is at the level of the common bile duct. Type 2 is described as the correctable, and it, sorry, the type 1 is described as the correctable type. Type 2 is at the level of the hepatic duct, and type 3 is, which is the most common, is the level of the porta hepatis. This has been modified by many centers, but ultimately the original is still the most commonly one, commonly used one. So as I said, the Japanese classification really relates to the actual bile ducts themselves, whereas the other descriptions relate to associated findings such as the cyst of the porta hepatis, uh, biliary atresia splenic malformation, in which the biliary atresia is associated with other malformations such as a polysplenia or asplenia. Um, in this syndrome, we also find associations of the heterotaxia, pregeodenal portal veins, and interrupted uh, inferior vena cava. More recently, other subtypes have been described, such as cystic biliary atresia or cytomegalovirus associated biliary atresia. And the reason we've been describing all these different types is really related to prognosis in all the different groups. As mentioned, all of these different variants you know, really challenge the notion that biliary atresia is either acquired or congenital. And in fact, the answer is likely to be both. It seems that the more we study biliary atresia, the more we understand that it represents a consequence of multiple potential pathophysiologies, such as viral infections or developmental insults in utero, but all leading to a single endpoint. Surgery was initially undertaken to explore for the possible reversible or treatable type 1 variants. However, one of the Sindipritas day, Mario Krasai in 1955, was struggling with bleeding after a portal dissection for a type 3 biliary atresia and elected to simply create an internal drain for bleeding. And thus the first Kasai port enterostomy was created. To his unit's surprise, the patient then cleared their jaundice. And after this case, he elected to replicate the operation and sent the scarred portal plate for histology, discovering the small ductules were still patent at the plate and hence the reason for his success. Some of his early papers published actually suggest that the optimal timing for surgery was before 60 days of life and he found he had the best outcomes at that stage. Although this is true, he didn't realize that there is a more significant variation before that time too and the sooner one can operate, the greater chance of success. And this has been replicated in multiple studies. Due to the nature of certain types and the advent of antenatal screening, certain types have come to the attention of treating physicians much earlier, such as the cystic biliary atresia types, and this may in part account for why it has an improved prognosis. This operation has received international recognition only really from the 1960s, 
Um, and since this time, operations undergone various modifications in the hope of improving drainage, and this includes a wider dissection of the portal plate. Having said that, there are some centers in Japan who are currently advocating for laparoscopic portoenterostomies. So, for example, Paul Tam um, decided to do this in Japan, and then they reviewed all the results and then realized that they were having poorer outcomes than they did their open repairs, their open kasais. So they reverted back to doing open operations. But Yamataka's group also in Japan have showed comparative results, and in fact they are carrying on doing laparoscopic kasais, and they seem to have very good outcomes at this stage. So despite the similarities between and the differences between surgical techniques, there seems to be massive variation in the outcomes post portrait enterostomy between high-income countries and the low-income countries. And this we can see when you compare places like China and Japan, um, you know, very similar geographically and same potential pathophysiology, but different outcomes. And we see the same thing when you look at, for example, the USA or UK versus South Africa. So, you know, Tim was uh, introduced me, you know, when when he looked at the Johannesburg data from a few years ago, from two thousand and nine to twenty twelve, there were seventy patients that were diagnosed with biliary atresia in that time period. Only forty three of them were considered for surgery. Having said that, of the surgical cohort, only twenty eight percent of them actually cleared their jaundice after cassia porta enterostomy, um, and of that group. Less than 30% of them were alive at two years of age, despite two of them having a transplant. I know many of you are probably wondering, potentially it's got to do with the age of surgery. Um, and in this cohort, the mean age of Kasaya portoenterostomy is 64 years, uh, 64 days, sorry. <laughs> um, which is very respectable when compared to the other international literature. Steve Beaker Academic Hospital in Pretoria has got very dissimilar results, with only 36% of their patients becoming anecteric. Uh, through, and their median age of Kasaya was slightly older at 91 days. So how does this compare to the first world? The UK published their outcomes when they started having um, referral centres and they looked at their data in 2011. It was a similar time period of the two previous studies um, and they showed uh, a nicturic rate of 55% and their median age of Kasaya was 54 days. Um, and in fact, in this particular paper, Davenport didn't show any specific change in native liver survival regardless of the age of Kasai portoenterostomy. And that may have been based on the uh, patient selection at that stage. A paper published last year looking at the Japanese biliary atresia registry um, of all the cases operated on between 1989 and 2018 analyzed over 2,500 cases, demonstrating a jaundice clearance rate of 66% of those kids that were operated under 60 days of life, and 60% jaundice clearance for those operated on after 60 days. Looking at these numbers just shows you how common biliary atresia is in that part of the world. So what are some of the factors at play, apart from timing of surgery, technical difficulties, which all seem to be quite varied despite the outcomes that we see? So, you know, if the UK is doing wide dissections, Japanese guys are doing limited resections, we're all using the same perioperative protocols. The age of surgery doesn't seem to be too significantly different. Um, but, you know, I don't understand why our outcomes are so different to those that are in the UK. Steroids has been also a very controversial topic. Um, there's been this assumption that steroids decrease the inflammation and promote bowel drainage. So because it was a very controversial thing, King's College did a randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial looking at, at, at this particular thing. And they used a dosage of 2 milligrams per kilogram uh, versus a placebo. And what they found is that there was no difference in outcome between their placebo and their steroid groups. What they've done subsequently is up their dose to 5 milligrams per kilogram. This is our prednisone. And they found that it improved the acute drainage of bile and they had quicker clearance uh, to become anecteric. However, the long-term results and the time to transplant was no different in the steroid groups uh, versus placebo, just regardless of dosage. And this has also been seen in a meta-analysis published in 2011. Overall, they showed no benefit to native liver survival with steroids, 
but they did show sooner drainage and clearance of jaundice, especially in children under 70 days. So steroids is clearly doing something, and since we're all hoping for some advantage, we all still use it. Uh, the Japanese are so keen on steroids that they actually use pulsed steroids. So if they see any decrease in stool pigmentation post-operatively uh, for months afterwards, uh, they'll pulse steroids. Um, and, you know, we can't really fault their jaundice clearance results. Wilcott has published a, a study in 2008 where they looked at the use of urzo deoxycholic acid uh, in draining portoenterostomy patients. Uh, the patients were on routine urzo deoxycholic acid and they did baseline bloods. Then what they decided to do is to stop the urzo for six months. They repeated the bloods after six months and then reintroduced the urzo deoxycholic acid for another six months and then repeated the liver function tests again. And what they noticed is that when stopping the urzo deoxycholic acid, there was a decrease in liver function. Uh, but this was reversed when the patients were placed back onto urzo deoxycholic acid. So they now use it as a chronic medication. The UK is one of the few centres that still uses phenobarbitone um, as, a, as a, a chronic medication for post atresia cassia patients. Um, and it was also because they had a, a study that showed a very similar reversible cholecystasis, the same as what Wilcott showed with urzodeoxycholic acid. Having said that, there's a recent, patient, a recent paper looking at neonatal intensive care related cholestasis, which showed no improvement of cholestasis really with using phenobarbital, um, and significant improvement when they used urzodeoxycholic acid. They also cautioned against the use of phenobarbital in patients uh, due to its potential neurotoxicity in the developing brain. The liver histology has been long uh, has been the gold standard for liver disease for a long time, and it's been used really for staging of liver fibrosis and cirrhosis. Um, there's been sort of intermittent moves away from using biopsies due to the invasive nature and the potential complication risks. Core biopsies usually only sample a minuscule portion of the organ, um, and though it may be representative in, in some diseases with homogeneous fibrosis, you know, the heterozygous nature of biliary atresia can sometimes leave us uh, mis mis misled when it comes to the, the grading of, of fibrosis for these particular patients. So, you know, there's obviously various biochemical markers that you can be used, and they've been using them more and more. Um, Although they don't give us 100% correlation with liver histology, they're pretty good at monitoring disease progression. Class 1 markers are very specific, but they're often very, very expensive. Um, and class 2 markers are really non-direct surrogate markers for liver destruction. So when I was in the UK, um, sort of bordering on 2010, 2011, there was a lot of debate and, and hope that if we could use some of these surrogate markers, we could potentially avoid cassia portoenterostomies in, in patients that we knew were going to have a poor prognosis and rather send them direct for transplantation. Um, There's a lot of hype around some markers used in adult hepatitis um, as indicators in this particular area. Um, and one of these was the APRI or the AST to platelet ratio. So what we did is we embarked on a study looking at uh, at, at APRI and biliary atresia patients, and we looked at the patients managed between January 1999 and November 2010, and we correlated this with a liver biopsy at the time of surgery in an attempt to try and see whether it does correlate with fibrosis and cirrhosis. We also looked to see whether there's any you know, difference between APRI regard, uh, depending upon the type, the subtype of biliary atresia, and we wanted to see whether it would be a good prognostic indicator. Uh, the other thing we looked at is whether it could potentially give us an idea about at what level uh, in, uh, endoscopy was required uh, for intervention for variceals. So we looked at uh, 260 patients, slightly more females than men. Um, the age, uh, the median age was 58 days, a range up to 209 days. And the um, majority, as expected, were isolated biliary atresia patients, um, relatively flu cystic biliary atresia patients. And retrospectively, we then also looked at the Ig uh, positive rates, which were relatively low compared to the population group. So what we found is that the APRI uh, 
was higher in patients that didn't clear their jaundice um, and it was statistically significant. Uh, what we also noticed was that um, the patients with the lower APRA had significantly improved native liver survival. And we took the APRI of less than 0 0.43 for our forced first quartile. When we were trying to see whether there was any sort of comparison in terms of subgroups that would give us some clues in terms of the pathophysiology um, behind it and whether this was a good sort of prognostic sign, there was no real difference between isolated anomaly and, and cystic biliary atresia. There weren't clinically, there weren't uh, significant differences in the APRIs between those groups. But when we compared the CMV group, they were significantly higher, the APRI values. Um, and the outcomes of these kids also, you know, wasn't particularly good. And this was really borne out by further studies looking at the same cohort and uh, longitudinally uh, to follow. And what they found really was that, you know, the CMV positive patients, they cleared their jaundice in only 15% compared to their non-CMV cohort of 52%. Um, they also had a much lower survival in terms of natal liver as well as the patients themselves. Um, after recent discussions with Professor Davenport at King's College, they've started now using GAN cycliver routinely in all their CMV positive IgM patients, um, perioperatively depending upon their steroid regime. And he says they've all but reversed those uh, anecdotic sort of discrepancies and survivals just based on that. So. One of the other major areas of consideration when it comes to complications uh, of patients with biliary atresia, you know, we can see these obviously in patients that have both a draining port or enterostomy and those that also don't have a draining port or enterostomy or weren't offered a kasai. Uh, draining port or enterostomies are generally considered sort of a delay tactic, you know, as like about two thirds of them will ultimately require liver transplantation. You know, while sort of you know, decreasing the speed of impending liver failure, there are a few areas of concern specifically to draining casais, which we need, which includes things like ACN and cholangitis um, and the rest of, of bile drainage. Uh, they can develop bile lakes and a few other complications. You know, urgent treatment of these conditions really does improve the longevity of their working casai. Um, but if any established damage does occur to the portraenterostomy, this rapidly progresses to liver failure. In non-draining or patients that haven't received a port enterostomy, you know, the, may, the majority of them become cirrhotic within a year or two of life, um, either requiring transplantation or passing away. Um, and you know, all the patients with biliary atresia, regardless of being uh, having draining casais or not, are prone to the natural sort of gambit of, of liver-related complications such as portal hypertension, ascites, and malnutrition. And being on top of these goes a long way in terms of their long-term survival. Preemptive treatment has become a big topic, um, and it's one of the key sort of improvement strategies for survival um, and for sustainability, also for liver transplantation. Uh, looking at the South African statistics, one of the poor outcomes was related to malnutrition at the time of transplantation. So it's a big factor that's at, at play currently. A publication from Kansas City this year showed patients undergoing primary prophylactic endoscopy for portal hypertension. And what they found is that they managed to reduce the number of scopes by half compared to patients who were only scoped after a clinical bleed. They also demonstrated in patients that uh, they'd been, in patients uh, with all cause portal hypertension, they had decreased need for portal systemic shunting. Uh, with patients that were treated with primary endosc uh, endosc endoscopic prophylaxis. So, you know, in the high income countries, the outcomes approach sort of, you know, 60, 70, 80% anecdotic rates at six months of age, with close to 100% survival with the aid of transplantation. The one exception until recently, as I mentioned, has been those who have been CMV positive. Um, and now it looks like that's a reversing trend as well. And even the CMV patients are doing much better. Obviously, their incidence is much lower than third world countries. But, you know, why is it when you look at the outcomes of low and middle income countries such as South Africa, are our results so poor? You know, are we doing a different operation? Are we using different sort of prophylactic uh, or perioperative protocols? Not really. You know, we do the same things as what they are doing, you know. So, 
it made me think of of British cycling. I know it's a bit of a leap, but uh, between <laughs> 1908 and 2003, the British cycling team was so bad that they couldn't even get you know manufacturers to sponsor them frames to race with. Um, then in the early 2000s, they had a new coach that introduced the concept of marginal gains. And I'm sure people have heard about this. And uh, what they started doing is essentially looking for the 1% in, in everything that they could get their hands on. They redesigned seats to be more comfortable. They put alcohol on tires to improve traction. You know, they weighed their suits. They worked out which pillows were the best to sleep in so the guys, you know, got the best rest. They washed their hands so they had decreased time out from, from illness and so on and so on. And, you know, before this time period, they literally had one medal in 110 years preceding this. Subsequent to that, they've won 178 world championships. They've had 66 Olympic medals, five Tour de France victories. So, you know, and this is the one thing that high income countries tend to do very well. You know, it's the marginal gains, you know, from early referral to centralized centers, quick diagnosis, prompt surgery, optimized medical therapy, nutritional support, adjunct therapy early when there's enterocolitis, preemptive management of potential complications such as varices, early access to transplantation. All of these have, in my mind, made massive gains when it comes to uh, biliary atresia in the same way that the British cycling made massive gains when it came to their cycling thing. Um, in recent years, it may not have only been the 1%. So the ancient Greek legend of the Fijian Gordian describes the time when the Fijians were without a king. An oracle at Telmismus decreed that uh, the next man to enter the city riding an ox cart would become king. When a, a peasant farmer named Gordius drove into town on his ox cart, he was declared king as, as was stated by the oracle. And out of gratitude, his son dedicated the ox cart to the god Sabazias. Uh, and he tied it to a post as a, as a memorial uh, with an intricate knot of corn or bark. And this knot was later described as comprising of several knots that were so tightly entangled it was impossible to see how they were fastened together. And this knot stood the test of time. And the oracle decreed that as this knot was so effective, whoever could unravel this knot would clearly be a great leader in Asia. And so Alexander the Great was around at, those day, at that time, and he'd been trying in vain to undo the knot, and he was desperate to become a ruler. And eventually he decided that the way in which the ox cart was released was irrelevant. And all he did was he just, with a single strike of his sword, cut the rope loose and let the ox cart free. And... So to this day, the Gorya knot is, is a metaphor for an, an intractable problem that, that can't be solved uh, by common logic. Uh, but it can easily be solved by finding an approach that renders the knot inconsequential, inconsequential. For example, by cutting the rope. So perhaps it's time for us to look at Bilirrhea Atresia in the same way as Alexander the Great looked at that knot. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Andrew. Excellent talk. I like, it's such a surgical story, isn't it? So you, you can't untie the knot, just use your scalpel and get rid of it. So, <laughs> a man after uh, my own art. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I think I didn't introduce you properly in the beginning, I'm sorry, but Andrew is our Alexander the Great when it comes to Bilirio Atresia, <laughs> spending time with Mr. Bilirio Atresia in uh, England himself. Uh, uh, Mark, Mark Davenport. So we're very lucky to have you. I've got quite a few questions in my mind, but I'd like to invite people to either put their hands up or type questions into the chat and then we can we can address them as we go along. Um, and maybe while people are doing that, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll kick it off. Andrew, um, we, how often do you get children with biliary atresia below 30 days of age? Because that's the best survival rate internationally, right? So how often do you get them? 
And do you want in less than 30 days? Because anaesthetists won't be very happy. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's a, I mean, it's an interesting question. I mean, there are, there are, I mean, we almost never see kids at that age uh, presenting to us with biliary atresia. Um, and we've got one that just arrived today that's, uh, you know, four months of age already. And, you know, we're kind of contemplating, you know, what, what's the way forward with this child. Um, you know, there's some interesting papers, you know, suggesting that they had slightly poorer outcomes when they operated on kids sort of under 30 days or between 30 days and 45 days. So it seems to be, I'm not sure whether that's a technical issue related to the surgeons or what the story is, but it looks to be probably between 40 and 60 days is the, is the ultimate if you can get you know, your, if you can get early referrals or early pickups, that's probably the best time to do it. And it'll give you your best outcomes when it comes to trying to do a, a Kasai port Yeah. Cool. Yeah. I think we, uh, we definitely see patients presenting much, much later. Um, and to me, I think it's like you said, is not one step uh, or not one solution. Um, because it starts with picking up the jaundice in the pale stools, which almost never happens. And I, all of the patients that I see have been told by our clinic sisters to go put the baby in the sun um, over and over. But then it's, you know, even getting them referred to a center with a pediatric surgeon and getting them operated on um, and getting them um, or post Kasai, you know, optimal care. So we see a lot of malnutrition by the time they come to us. And um, yeah, lots of work to be done. Um, I've got a few questions. Mashiko says she's got an ignorant question. Now, Mashiko, as an adult physician, it's quite all right <laughs> to be ignorant. <laughs> so it says, do, apologies for an ignorant question. Do you always do a Kasai first or are there indications when you would go directly to transplantation? Andrew. Yeah. I think it's actually a very good question. Um, I, mean, I think there's a lot of factors we look at. I mean, one of the major factors that we are sort of discussing is the age of presentation. Um, and because it's a completely progressive disease, you know, normally the age of presentation will impact the severe severity of the liver dysfunction and cirrhosis or fibrosis of the liver. So, you know, normally once we feel that there's established liver cirrhosis or complications related to liver cirrhosis, we wouldn't really attempt to do a Kasai. Um, and most uh, publications show very poor drainage after about 90 days. Uh, you know, in, in places where you've got very limited access to transplantation, you know, we would sometimes err on the side of trying to offer a Kasai port enterostomy because at least we're offering something. Um, on the hope that even if it's that one out of 10 that may drain, um, even though they're an older patient, at least they'll be that one person that drains because the chance of them getting liver transplantation is also very limited in our, in our sort of limited resource state environment. So, you know, it, I mean, you know, if, if transplantation was easily available, um, you know, then most people, once there's any signs of, um, liver fibrosis or cirrhosis would send them directly for transplantation. Um, and anything, you know, definitely more than sort of 100, 120 days would go directly for transplantation. But we don't always have access to that directly. Yeah. Thanks, Andrew. Another question in the chat from Zamon Bele, uh, talking about the APRI score and other non-invasive scores to predict fibrosis and indeed clinically significant hypertension, portal hypertension in adults. Uh, what's is there data for a use on, in for this purpose in pediatrics or indeed biliary atresia? And did your study show an association between APRI and fibrosis on biopsy? Maybe you can start with the biliary atresia, and I'll do the the rest of PEDS. Yeah, I mean it's I mean it's um, you know now it's kind of been around for a while. Um, there's pretty good. Um, you know, correlations in terms of non-specific markers and blue atresia outcomes and fibrosis and cirrhosis. So, I mean, we did show um, a sort of a graded phenomenon when it came to, um, you know, the APRI and um, the grade of cirrhosis. 
But the problem is that the numbers are not specific. Like, you know, if you've got a number of one, it doesn't mean you've got a, a level of fibrosis of one. And if you've got an APR of five, you're completely cirrhotic. The problem is that it's, it's a, a graded scale. Um, so, I mean, it is validated in terms of, it does correlate to a level of fibrosis, but it's hard to pinpoint the number. And I think that's for many centers been the real kind of drawback. So it gives you an indicator, it gives you a guide you know, it's it's uh, it's like saying your bilirubins are elevated. You know, you know that there's a problem, but it, it doesn't always quantify the severity of the problem um, with a particular number. Um, so that's kind of how I see it. So yeah, you know, it gets it gets spoken about lots, and it is you know validated for use in bilirubin atresia. And there's quite a few studies with that, but it's actual on the ground clinical application is not always clear. Yeah, I'd agree with that. In other causes of cirrhosis as well, is that there isn't one cutoff that you can use to say this child has got varices or doesn't have varices. Um, so agreed. I think uh, Liz Goddard has a question. Go on, Liz. Yeah, Thank, thanks for a, a fantastic talk. And I, I mean, I also work in the States as a similar um, problem as Tim. And I think one of the problems we have is um, you know, the obstructed stools firstly aren't picked up, but our big differential would be neonatal hepatitis after we've excluded a cholidocal cyst. And even on biopsy, we, it isn't always clear which is a neonatal hepatitis and a biliary atresia, especially if you're trying to get them earlier. So we've tried to get operative cholangiograms with a biopsy at the same time. I think one of the problems is the surgeons are so busy that even the child could sit in our wards sometimes for two weeks waiting for this operative cholangiogram because they don't know if they're going onto a Kasai or just doing the cholangiogram. So I suppose that's a big problem for us. And I don't know how many um, centers in South Africa do Kasai's and what your feeling is of how many um, Kasai's you need to do to become competent or, or good at it. And a bit like Britain, is it worth centralizing, but then we need uh, enough surgeons to do it. Thanks, Liz. Go for it, Andrew. <laughs> yeah, it's a controversial topic. Um, you know, I mean, for example, the Netherlands doesn't have centralization and, and they've got numbers of guys doing one to two casas a year, but the outcomes are the same as the UK. You know, I, I think ultimately, you know, I, th I think you do need to have some experience with the operation. Um, and, you know, there are certain pitfalls with related to the surgery. But in my mind, the surgery is like really one small piece of the puzzle. Um, I mean, I, you know, and that's why I think our results are so bad compared to other high income countries. You know, I do the same. I mean, I, I, mean, I, I shouldn't say this, but, you know, I mean, I do a similar operation to what Mark Davenport does, for example. Um, but yet his drainage rates are 60, 70 percent. You know, mine are, you know, I mean, probably less than half of that, you know. Um, and I think it's all the other things. It's, it's uh, like I said, it's early access to surgery. You don't sit in the ward for two weeks. You know, their mean time from, um, you know, arriving in the hospital to having a Kasai is, is three days. And in that time, they've had all the investigations. They've had a liver biopsy. They've got the liver biopsy results. Um, they get put on the table. They have the operation. You know, whereas... You know, we have a patient that, uh, you know, for example, as Tim said, the, the mom's been going to the clinic every week or every two weeks since birth saying my kid is jaundiced. And eventually, when they start having more other complications, failure to thrive, those types of things, then eventually they will go on to a tertiary center where they'll eventually end up at a center where there's a surgeon or a gastroenterologist. And so by the time they get to us, you know, they are three, four, five months of age, and we've missed the window. And even if they get us when they're two months of age, they are malnourished. You know, they're probably CMV positive. Um, there's all of those factors at play. And so, so like I say, I mean, it's for me, it really is all the 1% that makes this a treatable disease or not. Um, and we are definitely treating some of the things the way the rest of the world does. But in the big picture, there are massive gaps in our puzzle that we're trying to build. And I think that's where we are falling short. No, no, look, I agree. I mean, we have a lot of CMV hepatitis with the bilirubin atresia or without. 
So we go through gallons of gang cyclover as much as our ID people hate us. So we, we <laughs> joined as child will get tested for it and they're all on Valsite. I think one of the other problems, I mean, we tried to get the stool charts put in the road to health booklet and they weren't interested. I'm not sure whether the maternal um, MOUs and the immunization needs a stool chart, even just in those clinics, if they don't want it in the road to health booklets, because the mother would probably tell the nurse that there's white stools and they need to just come straight in. And I think the other thing is I didn't realize, I mean, as much as we teach everybody that you need to work out if, if it's conjugated or unconjugated jaundice at two weeks of age, on the IMCI, which the nurses deal with, and they deal with all these jaundice babies, it actually doesn't state that. They've got different criteria, but they don't say do a blood test and check if it's conjugated. So I don't know what you feel, Tim, but in some way we've got to link what we teach the medical students and the nurses, because otherwise, I mean, there are thousands of jaundice babies out there, and very few have got biliary atresia or pathology. So it's trying to sift those out and get them sent earlier. Yeah, thanks, Liz. I think definitely that's a low hanging fruit that I've often thought about is all it needs is some nappy company to sponsor posters in the in the clinics with pictures of poo and, you know, people would be more aware. Um, so it's something that uh, we need to work on, I guess. Um, I also wanted to raise, Andrew, we, I often get kids from other hospitals, particularly in other provinces, that did present, um, and the time taken to diagnose biliary trees is just atrocious because first they wait for the sonar, uh, sonar is not conclusive, as you said, um, then they send them for a harder scan, et cetera, et cetera. So from your point of view, I've got a kid with jaundice and pale stools, and he's got an obstructive picture on his LFT. What should I do next? Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, from my point of view, um, and I, I mean, that's why I mentioned it in the presentation as well. I think any kid sort of over two to three weeks that is still jaundiced, um, if they've got a conjugated fraction, should come to a center where there are pediatric surgeons. Um, or even if any kid has got pathological, I mean, you know, I think, I mean, the problem is that, as you say, there's so many kids with jaundice out there, and where does the physiology really kind of change? But if it's a conjugated type of bilirubinemia and they joined us after two weeks, they should be in a center where there are surgeons. Um, and instead of wasting time, you know, doing ultrasounds that will be repeated anyway and doing bloods that, you know, will be repeated and take so long to get there, rather just send them to a, a surgical center and let them do the workup. You know, that would be my suggestion. Yeah, thank you. That's the problem that the nurses need to be involved in this because they see most of these jaundiced children and that's the problem on their guidelines. It doesn't say send for the blood test, which you should be able to do at point of care, really. Yeah, so I mean, they're doing either, you know, skin billies or billy guns or finger pricks and those things. And they're not often not differentiating. Um, but yeah, I agree. I mean, it, it should be a simple, you know, a serological sample that's two to three weeks if you're still jaundiced and then that should be red flagged and they should be transferred but i agree it's a primary health problem it's it's uh you know it's getting the kids into the system you know awesome thank you so much i don't see any other questions now's your chance Final moments. <laughs> okay, if not, then I just want to say a very big thank you to Andrew. I think we've got our work cut out, uh, many pieces in this puzzle that we need to, to fix. Um, so thank you for addressing us. Also, thank you to ECHO New Mexico and ECHO in the University of, uh, sorry, in uh, India, ECHO India, um, and to everyone who came online to, to listen. Um, you can give your feedback in the form on, on the chat uh, afterwards. Thanks to the Gastro Foundation. Thanks to Cheryl, Karen, Chris, everybody. And thanks to our sponsors. And we'll see you next week. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, Andrew. It was great. Thank you very much. Thanks, guys.